Hello, listeners. This is Kat. Welcome back to Put Your Hands Up Podfix. This will be the continuation of Wrong Answers. Don't mean you should stop asking questions. This will be part three. The train rocked rhythmically, making its way down the track unhindered. Izuku fidgeted with the straps of his backpack while he watched the scenery pass by, resisting the urge to check the newsfeed on his phone. Given the current overcast weather, it would be another 20-ish minutes until the mountain collapsed, and 40 minutes until he reached the closest stop to the town. He really hoped that his prediction was wrong, or that the heroes he'd reached out to and the town had used preventative measures to stop the impending landslide, but he'd been following social media surrounding the town closely for the past few days and had heard nothing. Of course, he could be wrong. The mountain might not collapse, but given the colder-than-usual winter they'd had, combined with the sudden torrential rain meant that it was near certain that the small cave systems dotting the mountain would face collapses. After being destabilized by a hero fight late last year, the cave systems had been blocked from public entry as they were deemed too risky to enter, but no other efforts had been made to reinforce the areas that those same cave systems supported. Their collapse would start a domino effect, resulting in a massive landslide that would decimate the nearby businesses and housing, and recent weather conditions provided the perfect setup for erosion-based weakening. He managed to waste another five minutes looking through the window, early morning light giving the world a slightly dreamy feel, and ran through first aid procedures in his head. Another five minutes passed when he couldn't remember if he'd packed disinfectant and had to rummage through the other medical supplies that he'd stuffed into his bag to look for it. Ten minutes from his stop, and the news broke, heralded by an announcement over the train speaker system. Checking the news revealed the full extent of the damage. Almost half of the mountainside had collapsed and slid down to the base, destroying any buildings that had been on or near the mountainside. Heroes and emergency services were rushing to the scene, residents encouraged to evacuate. Izuku felt a pang of regret and anger that he hadn't been able to do more than get the word out of the mountain's unstable state and that no one had listened to him when he had tried to warn them. However, there was nothing that could be done about that now. The train station was frantic when he got off, tourists rushing away from the site and residents looking for familiar faces, trying to contact loved ones in hopes that they weren't caught up in the landslide. Izuku pushed past the mall, making a beeline for the disaster zone. After all, the epicenter was only a few dozen meters away from where he'd predicted it to be. He hadn't expected to become so well-educated in natural disasters such as landslides, but after realizing predicting one was his best chance of meeting rescue heroes and asking them his question, he'd learned quite a lot. He could see a few heroes already milling around to the base of the mountain, bringing people down to the medical tents that had been set up, but now was not the time to ask them if they thought he could be a hero. There would be a time for that afterwards. For now, there were people that needed help. Climbing up and down the collapsed mountainside was strenuous work, the uneven terrain shifting every now and then, making the task of just walking difficult. Sweat rolled down Izuku's back, and he was sure there were dirt stains and small rips all over his clothes at this point. He was losing count of all the times he had walked up and down the landslide, his course often interrupted by helping people out of the rubble, treating what injuries he could, then helping them back down the mountain. It was exhausting, but there was no way Izuku would have waited at the base of the mountain to ambush heroes with his question. He grit his teeth and thanked his past self for doing so much stamina training, moving back up the mountain to help whoever he could. On the edge of a crater that used to be a building, Thirteen was directing several emergency workers who were carrying people away on stretchers. The scene was free from debris, so it was likely they'd use their quirk to clear the area and free any trapped people. Izuku nodded to some of the workers as they passed him, looking for any way he could be useful while he waited for everyone to leave. Once he'd switched to an alphabetical list, Thirteen had been at the top of the heroes due to their numerical name, unfortunately. They'd been out of the country at the time, so Izuku had been forced to move on to the next hero without asking them. Afterwards, he had kept an eye on the rescue hero and their movements, and came to the conclusion that he'd have to be at a disaster scene to have a chance of meeting the space-themed hero. And here he was, helping someone splint a broken leg before they could be loaded onto a stretcher. Luckily, Thirteen stayed on the scene until everyone was leaving, giving Izuku the perfect opportunity to walk up to them, as they coordinated with someone on the radio, probably trying to find out where they'd be needed next. Um, hello, Izuku asked tentatively, not wanting to startle the hero while they made their way over the uneven terrain. The hero looked over their shoulder, pausing when they realized it wasn't one of the emergency workers talking to them. Hello, how can I help you? I have a question, if you don't mind me asking. Izuku watched as they quickly looked around them, 
and down at the radio. Sure, just keep it short if you can. There's still a lot to do here. Izuka thought that was a valid request, so he kept his question short and simple, as it always was. Can someone without a quirk become a hero? He was braced for the inevitable no, but what he got instead was, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Thirteen's suit didn't allow a lot of expression to come through, but their tone was clearly confused, not the babying, belittling tone he had from some of the other heroes he had asked. Oh, he scrambled for a different way to phrase his question, wiping some of the sweat off of his forehead as he thought. Do you think a quirkless person could become a certified pro-hero? If they wanted to be a pro-hero just for the fame and attention, probably not. For that, you have to be marketable, and a big part of that is having a quirk to market. If they wanted to help people, however... Thirteen paused, looking at Izuka's dirt-covered state. Then they could help people the way you're doing right now, becoming part of emergency services, training to be a doctor, joining the police force, all these things help people, could give them the power to save people, without being a hero. So I guess no. I don't think someone without a quirk can be a hero, but that doesn't mean that you can't be helpful, or that you'll save fewer people. Does that answer your question? Izuku nodded, not surprised with the answer, though glad that Thirteen was one of the heroes that were as kind as they seemed. Are you all right? You look pretty tired. He hiked up his backpack, lighter than it had been at the start of the day, and shook his head. There are still people that need help. I'll be fine. Do you know where would be the best place to go next? Thirteen hesitated for a moment. This kid couldn't be as young as he looked, if they let him join the rescue efforts, right? Before directing him east. Thanks. He bowed and trekked on, leaving the rescue hero behind. He walked. He walked over broken trees and crumbled rocks, around broken posts that had once been a human construction, and he spiraled. He wished that he waited in town to see if the landslide would happen. Then maybe it could have buried him, and he wouldn't have to worry about this. Whatever it was. A fear-induced 2 a.m. quest. Was he all right? He sat down leaning against a log for support that caused his backpack to dig painfully into his spine. He couldn't find the energy to shift his position, though, because what the hell was he doing? It had been around eight months since the sludge incident, since he started chasing down heroes, and he was still going despite being told no, over and over again. Statistically, there was a hero out there who would believe someone quirkless could be a hero, but he'd spoken to... He swallowed, pressure building up in his throat. He'd asked over 100 heroes by now, and all of them had told him that he couldn't be a hero. He squeezed his eyes shut, the pressure of impending tears building for the first time in months, reaching for the emotionless place he'd been existing in for the past few months. He didn't want to acknowledge the swirling storm inside of him, the fear of reality and the horrific statistics he faced as a quirkless person. All he'd ever wanted to do was save people, to be a hero, and if he could prove statistics wrong on that front, then maybe he could defy everything else he'd ever been told. Useless. Weak, pathetic, worthless. A pang of fear, sadness, and worry passed through him as he raised his walls back up, protecting himself from the storm of his own creation. All the time he'd spent away from himself and his emotions, present but disconnected, undone because someone cared enough to ask if he was all right. The mountainside was quiet aside from the distant shouting and the gradual settling of the earth. Izuka took a deep breath, letting himself settle back into that quiet, detached place. There were still people that needed help. He could deal with this later. Getting back up, he continued his journey east, eventually stumbling on a couple who had been caught out hiking. The taller of the two women had a nasty gash on her arm and possibly had a concussion, but Izuka was able to disinfect and cover the gash with a bandage for the moment. It was difficult supporting the woman, who he learned was named Sazagi, with their height difference, but together with the help of Haru, who was doing her best to keep composed despite the tears running down her face, they managed to make it halfway down the mountain. Hey, you there! The call got their attention, though Satsuki's delayed response was worrying. Izuka shifted Satsuki's grip on him so he could look around at who was approaching, recognizing them as the hero Kesagiri men. The hero pulled up in front of them, with his pristine outfit, and looked like he had just arrived, as even heroes with quirks that would help them in this situation were covered in dirt by this point. Is there anyone else left at the site you came from? Haru shook her head. It it was just us up there, she rasped out, her voice betraying her tough act. Most of the most populated sites should have been cleared by now, Izuku added. I've just been looking for anyone that might have been trapped on their own, or giving assistance where I can. He leaned slightly to better support Satsuki. 
only for his foot to slip and send him pitching forward. Before he could face plant, Kesegiramin was there, holding him up and wrapping Satsuki's arm around his own shoulders. Why don't you let me take these two back? I'll be back up here once I've dropped them down at the medical tents to help search for other people. Uzuka wanted to argue with the hero that he could help the couple find on his own and there were more important places for a hero to be, but the thought of struggling with a rough, sloping terrain and being unable to support Satsuki properly had him holding back his response. She needed proper medical attention, and Kesegiriman would be able to get her that fastest out of the two of them. Okay, he said, nodding. He turned to Haru, giving her a smile that he hoped was less tired than it felt, and watched as they continued their slow descent with the hero. They had only gotten a few steps when Izuka remembered his question. Hold on a minute. The three figures paused and turned their heads. Can someone without a quirk become a hero? Usually he tried to avoid having other people around when he asked. Less chance of ridicule, but he was pretty sure the two women had more pressing things to worry about than insulting a teenager. Kasagiriman turned back down the trail and kept walking. An admirable goal, but they simply would not be able to keep up with the demands of being a pro hero. He didn't turn back, and after a few seconds, and a final look to Izuku, Haru followed. Izuku kept going. It was getting later on the day. When he reached a shrine, there were people milling about, but from the way they were dressed and the way they were recklessly hauling rubble around, he could tell these weren't professionals. The shrine itself looked like it had once been a decent-sized building, but the now mostly collapsed, its colors faded by the dust the landslide had kicked up. Hey, he called out, getting the attention of the nearest victims. Most of the people kept working, but a few met him as he came closer. Are you a hero? they questioned, and Izuka thought they really must be desperate if they were hoping a small, dirty teenage boy with a backpack was a hero. No, but I'll do my best to help. Another person pushed forward, suddenly, and grabbed his shoulders. Do you know first aid? Their eyes were desperate, and all Izuka could do was nod before they were pulling him along to what must be the designated medical attention area. He was greeted by scrapes, bruises, gashes, breaks, and concussions. Please, help them. I'll do my best was all he could offer, as he pulled off his backpack and got to work. Izuka wasn't professionally trained, but soon all open wounds were patched to the best of his abilities, and he began helping direct the frantic group who hadn't tried to descend the mountain due to people being stuck under the crushed half of the shrine. The structure had provided enough protection that they hadn't immediately been crushed, but they all knew it would only take a slight shift for the earth to break through their safe pocket. He brought up the need for supports, and soon enough the people who had been looking for suitable sticks to use for splints were also looking for logs that could help hold up the shrine if moving debris destabilized it. A few more people had made it out from under the shrine, immediately directed to Izuka to have any wounds treated with his dwindling medical supplies, and groups were organizing themselves to make the trek down the mountain when a call rang out. Lock on with these sparkling gazes! We've come to lend upon help! Coming out of nowhere... Stingingly cute and cat-like, wild, wild pussycats. Izuka felt relief at the sight of Ragdoll and Pixie Bob, heroes who would definitely be able to get the last victims out of the shrine. Sure enough, Pixie Bob got to work straight away, using her quirk to lift the dirt and rubble off the shrine, while Ragdoll gave her directions to ensure the people underneath were safe. Everyone else seemed to share in his relief, worried mutterings turning into chatter, exclamations of how they were excited to get off the damn mountain. He let the chatter become background noise, focusing on whoever he ended up working on. He was in the middle of wrapping a probably sprained ankle when a hand touched his shoulder. Hey, kid. We're getting everyone else to go down now. Izuka followed the hand on his shoulder up to Ragdoll. I just need to finish wrapping this. I think it's sprained, Izuka explained, not waiting for the hero's reaction before he went back to his work. What's the holdup? The kid's wrapping their ankle. Then that's everyone ready for transport. When he finished and stood up, both pussycats were waiting for him, Pixie Bob guiding the person he'd just treated to an earth beast to help carry them down the mountainside. She seemed to have made a path as well, a twisting trail free of boulders and broken trees. Good job on helping patch people up back there, Ragdoll stated from beside him, her persona as bubbly as usual. Izuku couldn't exactly say that he'd predicted the event, what happened, so he had brought along appropriate medical supplies and brushed up on his first aid knowledge, so he just made a non-committal sound. You should head down with them. We've still got some cleaning up to do, and you're looking a bit worse for wear. But there are still people who need help. Such energy, Pixie Bob rejoined them, leaning against Ragdoll while looking Izuku over. Stuck in a landslide and you still want to help others. 
But don't worry, kitten. We've got this section handled. You'd be more help going down with the others and keeping an eye on them until they're safe. It was a manipulation tactic, giving him a new goal which would make him do what they wanted, but it was a successful strategy to use in rescue situations when victims were distraught and still trying to figure out what was going on. Izuku himself used it a couple of times today. There would be no use going against the heroes. They did have a valid point in that he could make sure the descent went smoothly, and he was tired. It was well into the afternoon, and he'd been doing this for nearly the entire day. I'll make sure they get medical attention when we reach the bottom. That's the spirit, Ragdoll ruffled his hair, both pussycats giving him wide grins. I just have one question before you go. The wild, wild pussycats were fairly easy to find, but difficult to interact with, since they primarily worked on rescue situations or appeared in crowded, hero-based events, so he might as well make the most of this opportunity while he had it. Sure thing, kitten, they said at the same time, a brief look in the other's direction betraying the fact that they hadn't planned for that. Can someone without a quirk become a hero? Their energy immediately dropped, not a very noticeable amount, but for someone like Izuku who was looking for the slightest reaction, it was obvious. You have to understand, this job is very dangerous, as you've seen firsthand today, Ragdoll started. Would be nice to live out your dream and be a hero, but youth doesn't mean you can do anything. We all have our limits, Pixie Bob finished. Less direct, but still a no. So he said his goodbyes and made his final descent down the collapsed mountainside, guiding the group to medical tents and paramedics and avoiding those who asked him if he needed help. By the time he was on the train home, the sun was setting its orange glow lighting the world on fire. When he finally made it through his doorway, he was bruised, covered in dirt and rubble and exhausted. He barely had the energy to shower and make himself food since Ingo was working late. If he dragged himself to bed, injuries untreated because he simply had no first aid supplies left for himself, well, he didn't have to tell anyone that. Stepping back from the map of Musutafu he attacked to the wall, Izuka tried to pick out a pattern. Multicolored pins dotted the surface of the map, all color-coded based on Eraserhead sightings. Whether they were just a sighting or part of a hero fight, if it was from a confirmed source or just speculation, etc. For someone trying to figure out a pattern, there were a depressingly few number of pins. The underground hero was next on his list, and should have been relatively easy to track down considering he worked within Musutafu, except he had no set patrol routes, didn't appear in official media releases due to his underground hero status, and wasn't tied to any agency which was near unheard of in modern heroics. Even powerful, loner-type heroes still had agencies to help with financial management, legal issues, and media releases. Scrolling through forums was borderline useless, since the most comprehensive documentations of the hero he'd seen were on the Underground Hero fan page, verified information but not a lot of it, and a forum dedicated to proving that Eraserhead wasn't a hero and was, in fact, a modern cryptid. Many more resources— a lot more random information to sort through. All official heroes had a public profile, and he could have potentially used information provided on Eraserhead's quirk to search the quirk database, which was not meant to be accessible to the public, but he'd learned that just because something wasn't meant to be accessible did not mean that it was impossible to find a way in. And find out his identity that way, but as an underground hero, his quirk wasn't listed in order to prevent villains from finding out a way to counter the effects. He knew vaguely that the hero had a quirk nullification quirk, eyesight-based if the goggles and fighting style were any indication, but without his official name, there was no use looking for it. Izuku had dealt with underground heroes before, but none had been as difficult to track as a racer head. Running through the streets at night and climbing up buildings didn't work out, though he'd known the chance be stumble onto the hero was low. He had met a few heroes on nighttime patrol that way. They said no, and ran away from several villain fights that had broken out when he happened to be passing by. Now, he was trying to put analytics to use, but Eraserhead had no patterns that he could pick out. If Izuku had access to police reports, he could find out more on where and when Eraserhead detained villains, but police servers were still too tough for him to crack. He groaned and sat back down at his desk, hands hovering over his keyboard as he tried to think of what else he could do to find the elusive hero. A day and a half of dead ends, and he finally got a lucky break, he'd created a small program that let his phone get updates from the Hero Network. Full access was limited to his laptop since it had actually been patched into the network when he gave himself access to the supposedly hero-exclusive network, and had caught the tail end of Goliath's agency requesting more recon or stealth-based heroes to help with a bust. The team had wanted Eraserhead's help, but the hero was, apparently, limited by school hours. 
There was only one nearby school that had Pro Heroes as teachers. Gaining access to full UA files would be impossible with their internal system, but there was basic information on every teacher on their public website. None of Izuku's searches had managed to find Eraserhead's hero name, but listed amongst UA staff was one Aizawa Shoda, whose appearance was the closest to the pictures of Eraserhead Izuku had been able to find. Searching for Aizawa Shoda had brought him few results, just the UA staff page and a few clips from an old UA sports festival. But watching the way he moved in those festivals left Izuku with no doubt that Aizawa Shoda was a racerhead, and that Izuku's best chance of asking the underground hero his question was to go to UA. Unfortunately, UA's grounds had incredibly complex defenses, so there would be no sneaking in. No, Izuku's best chance was to enter the school as a student. He counted himself lucky once again when he saw the entrance exam is just over a week away, giving him time to prepare for both written and physical portions of the exam. He'd done research before. Would they even let a quirkless person enter the school? But now, he had the tools to discover exactly what happened in the physical portion and what kind of unpredictable topics would be included in the written portion. He felt a slight sense of nostalgia, going over information he had read what seemed so long ago, but he couldn't linger on the feeling for too long. Going to UA to become a hero was, is, could be, his dream, and he needed to focus if he was going to find a racer head and ask him if he thought he could be a hero. There was one day before the UA entrance exam, and Inko couldn't stop pacing around. She wanted to be supportive of Izuku, but he was quirkless, facing against who knows what kind of quirks, and she knew he would be crushed when the rejection letter came. She didn't know if she could handle seeing him without his drive. All that would be left were tacked-on smiles and empty eyes, a sight that still haunted her, ten months after he had come home from that villain attack. He was doing better now, she thought, even if he was a bit distant and stayed out too late and came home with scrapes and bruises that he never explained. But he was doing better. Hey, Mum, do you know where I put my notebook, the red one? His voice drifted down the hallway, and Aiko forced herself to still. It's on the kitchen bench, she answered, moving to intercept him as he went to retrieve it. Thanks. When she rounded the corner, she was met with tousled green hair, Izuku's face already buried in the notebook, for a moment. She feared they'd run into each other, but Izuku he used to be so clumsy at least he told her so, danced around her without looking up. Izuku, could I ask you something? He stopped on his path back to his room, but didn't lift his face up from the book. Yeah? She hesitated, hands fidgeting together. Do you really want to try for Yue? It's just so difficult, not to mention dangerous, and I don't want to see you getting hurt. She reached a hand out, wanting to hold him wanting to show some sign of support, even though she couldn't bring herself to encourage him. But the action was absorbed when he looked up from his notebook. When did he get so tall? The eyes she looked up into were filled with determination that burned, a blaze that consumed the empty field she'd glimpsed on occasion, lighting his green eyes from within. I have to get in. And with that, he returned to his room, leaving Inko wondering once again what drove him and what would happen when he failed. Izuku was anxious, the kind that, even when repressing your swirling thoughts, still left you feeling nauseous and on edge. It had been a while since he was this nervous, but this was Yue, and his one shot of reaching a racer head. He was distracted enough that he tripped only a few meters from the gates, muscle memory saving him from face planting as he came up from a roll and continued walking, completely missing the brown-haired girl behind him, with her hand reaching out as if to stop his fall. Seeing present Mike, doing the physical exam presentation kept him from looking over to Bakugo, who he was seated beside. He hadn't had the chance to ask the voice hero his question, but he was known to be very sociable, even if incredibly busy, which made sense given he was a hero, teacher, and radio host. Maybe after the exams he'd be able to approach Mike. For now, he had to focus on passing the exam, and decide what strategies he was going to use against the robots they'd be fighting. Looking through forums for removed posts, then restoring those posts, had let him learn what the physical portion would involve ahead of time. Yue was an expert at hiding the details of their physical exam, but some data was impossible to destroy. Another student called him out for letting out a continuous muttered stream of plans, defensive and offensive strategies, and speculation on what materials he might have access to. He mumbled an apology, but by the time the presentation was over, he had all of his strategies finalized. With a final goodbye and good luck to Bakugo, who hadn't heard Deku speak in over a month, who'd forgotten he had wanted to take the UA entrance exam and was slightly shocked at being addressed directly and without fear. He joined the outgoing students and loaded onto the bus that would take him to his testing area. 
Several minutes into the exam, a few things had become apparent. One, the robots were fairly easy to beat, all things considered. He destroyed them by ripping out wires, making them hit each other with ranged attacks, shoving metal shards between their defenses, tricking them into running into walls, dropping chunks of debris onto them from buildings, and using a makeshift sling fashioned from a strip of his sweatshirt to disable the robot's sensors and cameras. It was hard work, evidenced by his heavy breathing, the scrapes and bruises that had accumulated on his back, arms, and legs, and the sweat running down his body, but it wasn't impossible to bring the machines down. Which brought him to his second observation. People relied on their quirks far too much. Yue was known to be a tough school to get into, and heroics work was difficult and multifaceted when it came to the skills needed to be a successful hero, but so many of the examinees he'd helped were trying to rely solely on their quirks, even if they were ill-suited for the exam. He'd spent almost as much time helping other applicants as he did fighting robots himself. Watching another examinee rush off without thinking him, while he brushed over the place the hunk of concrete had collided with his arm instead of their head, he reminded himself that it was for the rescue points. He hadn't been able to pinpoint how they were awarded, but he'd taken several hits meant for other applicants, helped others take down robots they were struggling with, and given pointers to those who were left virtually quirkless in a fight against a machine. Most of the latter had listened, but not acted any further, resigned to their fate, though one purple-haired boy had immediately started fighting back using a broken-off pole, fire in his eyes and a snarl on his face. He shook his head and kept running. He still needed more points to be sure, and time was running out. It was as he was prying off the head of another two-pointer that the world shook, and the zero-pointer revealed itself. Examinees ran from the scene, not willing to risk their well-being in a one-sided fight for zero points. Izuku could easily agree with some of the deleted comments he'd read online. The robot really was overkill. He finished removing the head of the two-pointer and started heading away from the zero-pointer in a steady jog, until he heard a faint cry. Spinning in place, he was just able to make out a figure lying in the wreckage from the zero-pointer's emergence, struggling to escape a hung of concrete that was trapping their legs. Steadily approaching them was the zero-pointer itself, the unbeatable monolith set on a course that would crush them. Every fight as he could ever been in was one-sided, but that had never stopped him from intervening. There wasn't enough time to take out each of its eyes, and there was no way he'd be able to rip out a few wires to take it down, so he had to think of another strategy. Spying several metal construction poles lying nearby, a plan formed in his mind. Retrieving two of the poles, he sprinted over to the zero-pointer, not daring to take his eyes off of the machine as he assessed it for weak points. He just needed to find a way to slow it down for a minute. As it extended its arm, he saw his opening. Ideally, he'd be able to target its legs, but they were too far away, and with its slow-moving pace, the zero-pointer's arms were the more immediate threat. Skidding to a stop, he widened his stance, took aim, and let one pole loose, throwing it as if it were a javelin. He didn't wait to see if it struck the machine's elbow as he had planned, instead taking off once more to where the person was lying. It's going to be okay, he assured, his experience helping civilians around villain fights and disaster zones kicking in. His voice was unsteady from exertion, but he knew how important communication was in these situations. I'm going to get this stuff off of you, but you need to be ready to move. Receiving a nod and confirmation, he grunted, shoving the end of the remaining pole under the rubble in an attempt to lever it off of the girl's legs. The zero-pointer was making some worrying sounds behind him, but he forced himself to stay focused on the task at hand. Look out! The shout came from the trapped girl as he finally managed to pry the rubble off her, falling forward from the force of the action. It was probably that that saved him from severe head trauma. As he fell down, the girl pushed herself up, hand outstretched, and touched the large chunk of concrete that had been hurtling towards the pair at high velocity. It now floated harmlessly in their direction, unaware of the pain it had almost caused. Azuka's eyes flickered from the piece of rubble to the zero-pointer. It was still gaining on them but the arm closest to them was limp from the elbow down, while the other continued to destroy the nearby buildings, probably where the concrete had came from. The girl herself wasn't looking too good, dust covered and shaking, hand covering her mouth. Can you walk? He asked, picking himself up from where he fell and extending his hand to the girl, ignoring the new grazes on his palms. She looked up from her half-seated position before slowly taking his hand, her pinky raised. Trying not to be too rough, he pulled her along with him, and set a quick pace away from the robot. They just needed to reach a side street and get outside of its damaged radius. The robot probably wouldn't follow them, and after that, they could stop and Izuka could look the girl over for injuries. The girl, he had to get a name soon, stumbled, 
before stopping him with a strained, Wait. He paused, keeping an eye out for danger as she brought her hands together, uttering, Release, as bits of debris and robots came crashing down. He only had a second to marvel at the strength and versatility of her quirk when present Mike's voice sounded around the cityscape, declaring the end of the exam. Exhaustion trailed him like a predator, with its prey in sight. His whole body ached, but he knew that was the price of the points he had gathered. He just hoped it would be enough. His attention was drawn from his self-assessment when the girl doubled over, vomiting onto the concrete. "'Are you all right?' He was pretty sure this was a stress or quirk overuse-induced reaction, but that didn't stop him from worrying as he hovered nearby, wishing he had water to offer her. "'Oh, dear. Here's some water.' The gentle voice came from just ahead of them, an old lady making her way through the few students that had remained nearby to watch the zero-pointer. In one hand, she held a syringe-like cane, while the other offered up a water bottle. "'Thanks,' the girl croaked out, accepting the bottle." Izuku managed to snap out of his quiet fanboying when Recovery Girl turned to him. You look a little worse for wear. He let out a nervous huff of a laugh. Recovery Girl had such a rare and powerful quirk and was a legend amongst heroes for the lives she had saved. There would never be a better time to ask her than now. Getting his breathing under control, he spoke, hoping he didn't sound too exhausted and desperate. I'll be all right, but could I ask you something? He waited a moment, and when no objection came, he continued. Can someone without a quirk become a hero? She mulled over an answer. Well, it's very difficult to be a hero, dear. She didn't add anything else, but it was easy enough to find the no in the statement. It's very difficult to be a hero, so it would be impossible for someone without a quirk. He'd heard it before. Let's heal you up, and you can think about heroics. And with that, she planted a kiss on his forehead. The exhaustion that had been trailing him pounced, and he felt his knees buckle before the world went black. Ochako looked at the blood that was on her hand. The exam had pushed her to her limits, leaving her feeling bruised and battered. But it hadn't made her bleed. The boy was gone now, taken away by robots and accompanied by a recovery girl who assured he was fine, just exhausted, and had therefore passed out when she'd used her quirk. Ochako regretted not being able to thank him. She'd watched everyone run away from the zero-pointer. Some of them had even seen her, made eye contact, but they'd still chosen to run. Everyone except the green-haired boy who appeared out of nowhere, who ran towards the zero-pointer and did his best to help her, despite the danger. And he had asked someone else if someone quirkless, and had she seen him use a quirk, could be a hero. It didn't matter what Recovery Girl had said on the matter, he was her hero. Closing her bloody hand, she decided she would thank him through action if she couldn't tell him. After getting changed and cleaned up, she walked to the staff offices. Hey there, what are you doing out this way? The call brought her attention to a newly opened door where present Mike stood, leaning against the doorframe. I'm sorry for intruding, but there was a boy at the exams with curly hair and freckles. She took a deep breath, knowing that this could cost her a place at the school. Could I give him some of the points I earned? After all, she wanted to be a hero for money. The world needed more heroes who would do their best to save anyone, no matter the cost. That boy saved my life, and I want to give him at least as many points as he gave up by saving me. Present Mike uncrossed his arms and stood up properly. I'm afraid we can't give him your points. But if he really is hero material, he'll be fine. Ochako frowned at the cryptic answer before giving the hero a bow and saying goodbye. She hoped the boy got in, so she could thank him properly. When his mom gave him the letter from Yue, he took it silently and retreated into his room. He knew that she would worry and that he should just open in the lounge, but he didn't want to see her face if he'd failed not without bracing himself and preparing a response. She'd been fretting ever since he told her he was going to take the exam, and he hadn't made her any less worried by getting home so late afterwards. He'd had more injuries than Recovery Girl had accounted for, and that combined with his already low energy meant he'd spent the afternoon sleeping in the infirmary. Now, he would see if the effort had been worth it. Gently, he opened the envelope, pulling out several folded pieces of paper and a holographics disc. As soon as he placed the disc on his desk, a display popped up, he barely listened to what Nezu was saying, until the results appeared on screen. Second place, with 41 villain points and 35 rescue points. For a 76-point total, Midoriya Izuku. He double-checked the letter to make sure that the projection was correct, that he'd gotten in, before opening the door to a tearful Inko. Before she could ask him anything, he wrapped her in a hug. I got in. He felt her tears start soaking his shirt as she began speaking, her words muffled. 
Oh, Izuku, of course you got in. You're so clever. My baby's growing up. You've been working so hard. And you know what? I'm going to make Katsudan for dinner to celebrate. He laughed at her ramblings, reminded of where he got the habit from and held her tight. It had been difficult, but now he would definitely be able to ask Eraserhead his question. The class congratulated Bakugo on getting into UA's heroics course. Their homeroom teacher even announced it the day after the results came through. When seeing Izuka's name, however, he paused and brushed it off as a misprint. Izuka didn't correct him. He had other things to worry about, to plan. With his teachers being pro-heroes, he'd need to find a way to ask the heroes he hadn't already met without disturbing classes. When Izuku opened the door to 1A, he was greeted with shouting. He froze for a second before recognizing Bakugo and the boy who'd reprimanded him for muttering. He tried to get through the door unnoticed, but the movement must have caught the blue-haired boy's attention since he was suddenly approaching. I'm from Somei Private Academy. My name is Ida Tenya. I'm Midori Izuku, he answered quietly, ignoring the confused shout of Deku from Bakugo. Midoriya. He was prepared to hear a criticism, a remark about how he shouldn't be here. What he wasn't prepared for was Ida to begin monologuing. You perceived the true nature of the exam while well, I did not. I misjudged you at the entrance exam. Clearly you were the superior candidate. Izuku backed away slightly from the intense boy. What are you talking about? You recognize the importance of saving others, going to save that girl. Oh, that was... I knew? He paused, getting his frantic thoughts in order. I knew about the rescue points. Ida looked down at him. How is that so? Finding information on the entrance exam is impossible. Well, it's not impossible, just incredibly difficult as UA has several programs that scan all online mentions of the entrance exam for any information leaks, then delete those mentions. But just because something has been removed from viewing doesn't mean it's been permanently deleted. By going through different forms, I was able to recover posts from around this time in previous years and then find mentions of the physical exam that way. Of course, you might need to go through several pages of archive material to even get one bit of useful information, but I was able to learn about the basics of the exam and the rescue points after a day of work. Other details I had to dig deeper for, which is much more complex given... Before he could go more in depth, he was interrupted. That curly hair! You got in! Turning away from Ida's perplexed expression, he was met with the girl from the engine exam. I wasn't sure you'd get in with present Mike being so cryptic, but I'm glad you did. Wait... What did President Mike say about me? He hadn't spoken to the voice hero between now and the exam. He had never interacted with him at all, aside from listening to his radio show, so he had no idea how the man would have an opinion of him. Well, after you went to all the effort of saving me, I thought it would only be fair to give you some of my points, since you lost time by helping me. She blushed slightly, rubbing the back of her neck. I guess I didn't need to bother, though, with all the rescue points and all. Izuka didn't know how to respond. The cutoff for UA was so high and she'd been willing to give him some of her points, even if it jeopardized her own position. He must have been quiet for too long, because she started talking again to fill the silence. So, we've got the entrance ceremony today. That's pretty exciting. I wonder what our teacher will be like. Apparently they're all pro-heroes. I hope we get a cool one. If you're here to socialize, get out. This is the hero course. The girl cut off and stared at the sleeping bag behind her. The whole class grew quiet as it stood up, revealing none other than a racer head. He looked scruffy, hair unkempt, but it was undoubtedly him if the capture weapon around his neck was any indication. Izuku resisted the urge to blurt out his question then and there, but he'd been doing this long enough to know when to hold back and wait. After all, this hero was going to be his homeroom teacher. Surely he'd have a couple opportunities to ask him. He continued to let his thoughts wander as he took his gym clothes and headed to the changing rooms with the rest of the class. Maybe he could ask him at the end of the day or arrive early tomorrow and ask him then. Of course, he could be the type of teacher who only showed up at the last minute. But that made sense. With the nighttime patrol hours, he probably slept until the last minute possible, which seemed plausible considering he'd shown up to class in a sleeping bag. The unprofessionalism didn't change the level of respect he held for the underground hero. He'd been going over the bits of information he'd managed to find, and had discovered the hero fought practically quirkless, especially against mutation-type quirks whose effect he couldn't nullify. He didn't acknowledge the few looks he got when changing, knowing people would be curious about the assortment of small scars he had covering his body. He'd had his fair share of marks before this year started, but actively hunting down heroes had brought him closer to danger than ever before, and he had paid for it on more than one occasion. He didn't care what they thought, though. He just had to get through today. And ask Eraserhead his question. Then it would all be worth it. 
His hopes of getting through the day dropped when the quirk assessment test was announced. Then Eraser had declared whoever placed last would be expelled. He balled his fists and took deep breaths. He was so close to his goal, and he wouldn't let go so easily. He just needed to stay long enough to ask Eraserhead his question. Then they could kick him out. Aizawa showed I was having a normal first day, his quirk assessment and threat of expulsion having become somewhat routine at the start of the year. He knew the other teachers had a bet going on how many kids he'd expel on the first day, but he wasn't about to acknowledge that, let alone get involved. The only difference to this quirk assessment, however, was the fact that one of the students didn't have a quirk. Midori Izuku, first quirkless student to be admitted to UA, and the second highest score on the entrance exam. Even though he fought quirkless, Shota's quirk still gave him the advantage of leveling the playing field between himself and his opponents. That, however, didn't apply to robots, and he'd spent his first year at UA fighting tooth and nail to transfer into the heroics course after being overwhelmed at the entrance exam. Shota watched the boy closely, not wanting to miss how he responded to each test, in case the entrance exam had been a fluke. However unlikely that was, he looked over the footage, and the kid had been relentless. The 50-meter dash, sidesteps, and endurance run were nothing to write home about, but he managed to find a way to improve his scores on almost all other tests. The grip strength test had him climbing up to support beams in the gym, using his shoelaces to tie the grip test to the beam, then jumping down while holding it in order to get his body weight and the force of gravity to his base grip measurement. He then scaled back up the beam to get his test down, all before someone could question what he was doing. For the long jump, he utilized loopholes, jumping first onto the robot meant to measure their jumping distance and then to the edge of the sandpit. As their jump was measured from the start of the sandpit to where they landed, the result was much higher than the average jump. He made use of tools once again in the softball throw, tearing his uniform to create a makeshift sling, allowing him to gain more distance, and showed anew from Snipes long-winded discussions on projectile weapons that slings were harder to use than they looked, which meant the kid had practiced for some time. The upper body and seat-to-toe-touch test didn't bear any clever solutions, but he had to call an end to the upper body test instead of simply waiting for all students to eventually tire and stop. The kid had just kept going, making him wonder where the boy was storing that strength and stamina in such a small frame. The reality was that a fear of falling off buildings and plummeting to your death were powerful motivators when it came to working out. Throughout it all, the first entrant, Bakugokatsuki, watched him like a hawk, Midori didn't seem to notice, and Bakugo didn't do anything, compared to several other students who complained that some of Midori's strategies were cheating, aside from watch, body language tense. He made a note to keep an eye on that situation. Competition was healthy, but it could quickly turn sour in a prestigious establishment such as UA. Overall, he'd been impressed by this year's students, even if a few had been lacking in the physical department. He'd seen the relief on the lowest-scoring student, a boy named Shinso, who had a psychological quirk and apparently no physical training when he'd revealed the expulsion threat was a fluke. He wondered idly where the quirkless kid had learned to fight as he made his way back to the classroom, class dismissed for the day. Shota had gotten into the heroics course after a hard-fought first-year sports festival, his quirk and physical abilities not enough to overcome the robots at the entrance exam, something he'd retained a distant bitterness for. While they still believed the entrance exam was biased toward big, flashy quirks, he could no longer say that it was impossible for those without impressive quirks. After all, a quirkless kid had placed second. Anyone with a quirk, suited for the exam or otherwise, would never be able to use that as an excuse again. When he opened the door to the classroom, ready to grab his sleeping bag and nap in the teacher's lounge until the school day was officially over, he found Midoriya sitting at a desk, staring blankly ahead until Shota's movement caught his eye. Can I help you, Midoriya? He raised an eyebrow. The kid stood up quickly, backpack in hand, and he made his way over to where Shota was standing with his arms crossed. There was a few seconds of silence before the kid raised his head to look him in the eyes. A racer head. And of course, of course, the quirkless kid knew which hero he was. Can someone without a quirk become a hero? Despite having gotten into UA's heroics course, one of the most prestigious and selective heroics courses in all of Japan, despite placing well on a quirk apprehension test when he didn't have a quirk, despite surviving the day and not being expelled, this kid was asking Shota, a racer head, if he thought he could be a hero. As if he wasn't already on the path to becoming one. And looking into those eyes, that had just the tiniest flicker of hope amongst an ocean's worth of sadness and resignation, Shota came to the understanding that maybe the kid didn't realize. So he softened his expression and spoke gently. Izuku broke down into sobs, 
backlit by the afternoon sun that was filtering through the classroom windows, as Aizawa, a razor head Shota, became the first person to tell him he could be a hero. All right, listeners, this concludes wrong answers don't mean you should stop asking questions. Again, this is the first fic in the author's Frequently Asked Questions series. I do intend to do the rest of the series as well. The next fic actually takes things from the perspective of the heroes that Izuku had asked, and you get to see their internalized thoughts and stuff as well. So let me know your overall thoughts and reactions to the entirety of this fic. I absolutely love the fact that Midoriya still asks Aizawa, even though he already got into the heroics course. And there was some discussion on the last video, and I totally forgot about it. But there was discussion about President Mike and whether President Mike had said no to Midoriya because he was like in the 30s for his hero ranking. And I completely forgot that the author states in the fic that he never got the chance to ask President Mike. So for some reason, that totally slipped out of my mind when I first read it, or I didn't process it. But yeah, super, super glad that President Mike didn't say no. For some reason, hearing the other UA teachers like Ectoplasm and 13 and some of the other ones, and Cementos even saying that he couldn't be a hero was kind of like a gut punch because they're UA teachers. But knowing that President Mike at least didn't answer at least leaves it open that the possibility was there that he probably would have said yes. So <laughs> that really was relieving to me because for a second there, I really did think that maybe he said no, but thankfully that's not the case. All right, enough of my rambling about present Mike, but anyways, I hope you all did enjoy. And as always, thank you so much for listening.